I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, more, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, the good and the beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church. What does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there? Um, you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects. Welcome to the Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm your co-host, Matt Branco. And I'm your other co-host, Dean Detloff. Okay, folks, we're back at it. Um, we're into part two of our two-part series on Monopoly Capital. Last week, we took some time to set up the problem of Monopoly Capital as Paul Baran and Paul Sweezy saw it. Too Paul, too furious. Uh, basically, the idea here is that in contemporary capitalism, we're not dealing with smallish firms competing with one another to get like lowest prices or whatever. But instead, um, the primary economic actors are big corporations that have the ability to set wages and set prices. Um, and in the end, what you have is something that's more or less a monopoly. Um, a few gigantic corporations, you know, like running the show and uh, running the way the economy works. And that's bad. Why we think <laughs> not as rational as people would like to say. Um, if you missed last week's episode, that's okay. Um, I'd suggest to go back and listen to it and get the whole story about monopoly capitalism, but uh, you can do it later. It's fine. In this episode, we're going to kind of tackle the second part of the equation. We talked about corporations and surplus last week. Uh, this time around, we're going to talk about um, surplus again. Um, but more on the absorption of surplus. You think what corporations do with their Scrooge McDuck swimming pool of money would be obvious, right? They pay themselves a lot and they swim around the rest of the money and that's it, period. But it's actually a little bit more complicated than just that because there's a lot of money to be swimming around in and you got to do something with it. Um, or so says the capitalist, at least. <laughs> so in this episode, we're going to talk about how the reabsorption of all that money that corporations make is actually really integral to the way that capitalism works. So, um, man, if you if you ever want to know how the sausage of capitalism gets made, this is about this is about as as sausagey as it gets. This is deep in the weeds. Um, really important. <laughs> the sausagey but, weeds. Like, a lot of good mixed mes- the- metaphors here. <laughs> That's right. The the very sausagey weeds of capitalism. Um, all I'm trying to say here is that this is like it's deep in the paint, you know. <laughs> to throw another one in there, this is uh, this is off the beaten path of uh, of economics. I would say that's right. We're opening up the bowels of the beast and laying its entrails out to see uh, what's going on. Um, that's part of the sausage process, right there. <laughs> it is. It's the very first part, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, like Matt was saying. Last week, we're talking about monopoly capital, what's going on, and you might remember, uh, I'm sure you remember, (laughs) that uh, one of the important breaks with Marx that Brian and Sweezy make is about surplus and the way that what you could call the rate of profit or, you know, the the pace at which people can make money uh, rises and creates this massive surplus of capital. So Marx had this idea that actually the rate of profit is going to fall in a capitalist economy because competition um, does drive all kinds of prices down. And Marx was working with capitalist economies and uh, a particular form of capitalism in the 1800s. Brandon Sweezy say basically Marx was right about that in the 1800s, but it's not the 1800s anymore. They were writing this in the 1960s, and they make this pretty compelling case, I think, that in fact this kind of age of competition that would have driven profits down has sort of been replaced by a different situation where there are big monopoly corporations running the show, and not only does their rate of profit not go down, but it continually goes up, which you'd think would be great news. For capitalists, right? Uh, More and more profit. It's not going down. It's all pretty seemingly stable. Uh, They're not allowed to like cut each other's prices anymore. 
there's this kind of like uneasy truce or a uh, collusion of interests and so on. But in fact, uh, it creates all kinds of big problems to have too much money and a capitalist ideology or too much surplus, maybe is a more <laughs> precise way of putting it and a capitalist ideology. Um, so the the basic point that they want to make is uh, I'll, I'll let them say it, I guess, <laughs> in their extremely economist way. Uh, they say the whole motivation of cost reduction is to increase profits, and the monopolistic structure of markets enables the corporations to appropriate the lion's share of the fruits of increasing, increasing productivity directly in the form of higher profits. This means that under monopoly capitalism, declining costs imply continuously widening profit margins, and continuously widening profit margins in turn imply aggregate profits, which rise not only absolutely but as a share of national product. We can formulate as a law of monopoly capitalism that the surplus tends to rise both absolutely and relatively as the system develops. So again, this is the summary that um, not only is the, uh, the sort of profit of individual corporations rising, but all across society, or what they call the national product, uh, surplus is going up and up and up. And uh, we're going to talk about how that becomes a big problem. Right. It is a big problem, um, but... <laughs> I mean, if you're going to have a problem, uh, too much money on your hands is a great one to have, I think. <laughs> um, so in in the last episode, uh, I feel – okay, hang on. Let me say this. I feel like this problem is kind of hard to get your mind around. And in the last episode, something that we kind of did to ground the conversation in like more tangible terms was talk about the ways that capitalism is also kind of a story that we tell ourselves about the economy and how money works and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think maybe it's it's good to pivot back to that particular frame, mm -hmm. right? So here's one one way you might tell the story of like what big corporations do with their money, or um, you know what is what what they would do with the, the big Scrooge McDuck swimming pool that they do have. So once upon a time, before the full onset of capitalist political economy, <laughs> a long time ago, <laughs> uh, capital flowed through a political economy that we call feudalism, right? Uh, so in feudalism, um, there's a king or a queen who you know, um, has sort of like the proper claim to a particular region, area, country, I guess, however you want to frame that, it's fine. Um, but they can't work the land alone, right? Kings and queens, they are busy people, or I'm, or I'm led to believe. <laughs> so it, instead of uh, getting out there and farming it themselves, they will take the land and kind of parcel it out to their families and their best friends and their friend's friend's friend, um, the elite, you know, the, the, the fanciest people in, in society. So the elite um, would have land, but they don't. Also, they also don't want to do any of the work, right? Because they're too fancy. Mm -hmm. uh, so the elite would get peasants to work the land for them, right? So that's how the work would get done. Um, the king would give land to the, um, you know, the nobles, the elite. Uh, the elite would kind of like hire on peasants to work that land, and then, um, then it would sort of go from there, right? Uh, the elite who held the land would take the profits the peasants created or the surplus, I guess, they, that they created. It's not profits in the sense of a capitalist economy. It's different because it's feudalism, right? And they would take the, that stuff and they would basically blow it, right? They would have a big feast. They would have a banquet. <laughs> they would build a cap, uh, castle. They would um, give money to the church to build a cathedral. Um, things that are um, unproductive, I guess, is one way of thinking about it. Um, they're not um, – they're, you know, instead of taking those profits and like reinvesting it in higher wages for workers or better farming tools or more oxen to pull <laughs> um, a plow or something, I don't know. They'd have like a big feast, right? That's that's it. Um, it was wasteful, and irrational, um, not way to do business. That's for sure. Capitalism, on the other hand, is a different type of political economy altogether, right? Instead of uh, lords and ladies and kings and queens, you get one big corporation or, you know, a handful of corporations who buy the labor of workers to create commodities. Capitalists will pay workers for their labor time, um, but not their labor power, as we talked about in previous episodes. And then they would sell the commodities that the workers create at a higher price than, uh, you know, what it takes for them to make it or to pay for their labor. And then they use those profits to make their production process even more efficient. And that's uh, that's a rational economy right there, right? <laughs> uh, capitalists are taking their money. They're expanding. They're buying better machines. They're paying people better wages and so on. That's the story. But the story is, I mean, as usual, wrong <laughs> or kind of a big lie. Um, 
the hang up here is that the profits that big corporations make or the surplus can't all be reinvested into the production process for some like really weird reasons. Um, you know, you would think that if you were, I don't know, making shoes or whatever, you would just keep reinvesting the surplus profits that you have into the shoe production process. And you'd, you'd make shoes quicker and better and faster and stronger, um, like <laughs> Daft Punk says. But um, the, there's a problem. And uh, here it is. So Baron and Sweezy say, say this about uh, this particular problem of investing too much in the production process. So they say, the logic of the situation is as follows. If total income grows at an accelerating rate, this is what Dean was saying a minute ago about the, uh, the you know, profits rising sort of a lot, um, then a larger and larger share has to be devoted to investment. And conversely, if a larger and larger share is devoted to investment, total income must grow at an accelerating rate. What this implies, however, is nonsensical from an economic standpoint. It means that a larger and larger volume of producer goods would have to be turned out for the sole purpose of producing a still larger and larger volume of producer goods in the future. Consumption would be diminishing proportion of output, and the growth of the capital stock would have no relation to the actual or potential expansion of consumption. So this is the problem. Simply reinvesting your money in the production process is not possible or desirable if you are a capitalist more investment means that there's more production of commodities for an already like oversaturated market right like you know you can make shoes but at the end of the day like if you invest too much money back into production it just means more shoes in a com- in a market full of shoes like who wants all these shoes is the mm-hmm. question you should be asking and and it's like not enough people <laughs> there's not enough uh there's too much supply and not enough demand i suppose is, is what you get if you want to kind of simplify it all down right so um, the question that uh, that that Bran and Sweezy end up coming to is that, like, if you can't just simply reinvest it all in the production process or whatever and, and expand that way, um, capitalism has to figure out with, you know, something to do with all of this money or else their business is basically going to stagnate. Um, and uh, that's not what they want either. Right. So how do you take this money, all this extra money that you have? And how do you get it back into the economy in a way that benefits you particularly and nobody else? Right. And it's tough to even talk so simply because uh, the you that's there, right? You as one rich person, this isn't like a a problem that you're sitting in your boardroom office like trying to solve. Um, It's a problem for the capitalist class and it becomes a problem for everyone else, basically. And because capitalists don't think in these terms, uh, this is actually a cycle that happens all the time that uh, there's overproduction in one particular sector or people make too much of something or there's not enough demand for something and it screws over, you know, either an individual capitalist or a bunch of workers or like a whole national economy in some cases. Um, And there's all kinds of global ripples with those kinds of things. So what Brian and Sweezy are really trying to do, I think in the last episode, we were talking a lot about the sort of internal logic of a corporation, like what it's trying to do, why it's doing certain things and so on, why it doesn't price cut other competitors, all the kind of stuff. In this episode, I think the pivot is to say more about what are the rippling effects of those kinds of activities. Or like Matt was talking about feudalism as a whole, like system of economy with lots of different kind of tendencies or habits. Capitalism is also an economy with tendencies and habits. And that's what Brand and Sweezy are, are doing. And that's the Marxist tradition as well, right? So They depart from Marx on this particular point about the rate of profit or surplus, but what they're continuing on in a Marxist tradition is to say, what is the material logic, the kind of, uh, you know, where does the money really going? What are the, the, the sort of compulsions that capitalists feel and that all of us feel such that the profit motive is still kind of driving our society, but at the same time, kind of like destroying it, (laughs) you know, destroying it in some different ways. So maybe it's just helpful to make that distinction. In the last episode, we're talking more about that internal habit of the corporation. Now we're trying to look at like, what are the ramifications for all of us as a result of that kind of logic? Yeah. And calling it a compulsion, I think is really good because, um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll talk about how capital gets reabsorbed in a minute, but, um, it could get (laughs) reabsorbed in, different ways, right? Like it could, all that surplus capital could go towards like really nice welfare things like Mm -hmm. Medicare for all or something or uh, free college or or whatever. Right. But um, capitalism, because of the way that it is, 
uh, it does have particular compulsions, so that it can't be used for those types of things, right? That would be that'd be too much. That'd be silly to do that. So, uh, figuring out different ways to spend that money is uh, is a big piece of it, right? So maybe we could start out by talking about what surplus is at all, and that is going to help us also figure out why you don't want too much of it. That is just kind of laying around. There is a lot of literature on this in particular. Brian and Sweezy have uh, some pretty simple explanations of it, even in Monopoly Capital. But one thing that I love about the monthly review is it's a magazine that really comes out of this tradition, right? It comes out of the the kind of moves that Brian and Sweezy and some other people were making in the 60s and a little bit before that, too of trying to think about the economy in particular ways. And so what that means is in the monthly review, you get to read lots of other people summarizing these kinds of ideas, testing them out, seeing how they work, if they're still relevant, you know, over like 50 years later. And uh, so you can, I don't know, go to the monthly review and search all these terms, I guess, and (laughs) find way too many articles that you probably don't want to read. But there's a really neat one that I thought was also a really good summary. Like, if you don't want to read this whole book, but you want to get the basic points and this podcast is not helping you out, you can read <laughs> this uh, this great essay. It's by a woman named Mary Wren. Uh, it's from 2016. And the title of the article is Surplus Absorption and Waste in Neoliberal Monopoly Capitalism. And it's great. I'll link it in the, uh, in the show notes here so you can find it. Perfect. Yeah, it's great because... It also tries to attend to how monopoly capital adapts to neoliberalism. So this book that we're talking about was written in the 60s before Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter and everything else. And the kind of neoliberal wave really crashed, you know, in the in the 80s. So it's cool to see her update it. Anyway, she has a a pretty good summary uh, where she says this. The production of an economic surplus requires production beyond the subsistence level of output for a society. That's maybe the most basic way of thinking about it, right? Surplus is all the extra stuff, whatever you don't need to subsist. Within the context of monopoly capitalism, the economic surplus is more specifically defined as what is left of the potential output once essential consumption, that is the consumption necessary for social and material reproduction, has been met. So the same kind of thing, right? Once everybody else in an economy is able to kind of meet the basic subsistence, or at least capitalism, is able to meet its basic subsistence, right? Like, it has to keep a workforce alive. You have to at least have food prices at a certain level and uh, rents at a certain level and so on. And, of course, capitalism is always testing those limits. But you need that subsistence on at least, like, a national scale. And then, of course, internal to a corporation, you might think of it in terms of, like, it's the, the surplus would be the difference between whatever a corporation needs to do its productive process like wages and paying for new equipment and all that and all the profits that they make after the fact by actually selling the shoes or whatever they sell on the market. So surplus, uh, this is, I hope not too hard, uh, not too complicated. It's the, uh, it's all the extra stuff after you've met all your basic needs or all the needs of the production process. It's whatever's kind of left over. So that's the basics, right? This is the surplus that has a tendency to rise say, Brandon Sweezy. Exactly. There's all this, like, surplus floating around, and it can't go back into the production process, or it can't all go back into the production process without oversaturating the market and creating all kinds of other problems, right? Um, I think there's another term that gets introduced um, in this kind of area around surplus that Brandon Sweezy talk about quite a bit, um, and that is the word waste. Waste is – it sounds like a bad word. And, you know, it is. (laughs) But it's not all bad, right? Waste in this context is like the reabsorption um, of the surplus that's produced uh, through putting it into like inane and stupid things. (laughs) And this is kind of like the the important piece of the puzzle here. Um, This is what uh, happens with all with all that that screwed McDuck money that just is sitting in the pool. Um, So capitalists will find things to invest it in that are like, you know, there to. kind of strengthen their place in in the world or kind of give them more of a foothold in different sort of sectors. So waste is like what you'd call things like all the money that goes into advertising or lobbying or bonuses for CEOs or, um, you know, a massive military budget and like the imperialism that comes after. <laughs> so it, it's waste because it's taking the surplus that could go to things that are like, you know, housing or education and blowing it all and creating mechanisms that expand consumption and kind of strengthen 
the position of the big corporations in a society. So um, that that's the next big piece of this puzzle, right? There's all this surplus out there. You have to do something with it. And instead of, like, doing something meaningful, like, you know, you would do in a <laughs> – in a social society, perhaps, I mean, or or in a welfare society, either one, um, you know, you do something uh, pretty bonkers with it and you invent an entire industry uh, that's there to sort of manufacture desires in other people. Right. And I guess maybe we should even take a quick step back here, too, because um, two things that might be helpful to understand. So surplus, as we're talking about it now, is how it appears in a capitalist economy. It's this thing that has to get wasted for reasons that we'll explain in a minute, but surplus itself shows up in every society. So like Matt was saying, in a feudal kind of system, there's a surplus, but it's not treated in the way that it's treated in capitalism, right? It's like the it's up to the, the king and queen and the nobles to sort of, I don't know, <laughs> blow on whatever they want, but not to be invested into the productive process. Uh, Brandon and Sweezy are socialist people. And so communist people even. And so they have a, a different way of talking about what you could do with a surplus They're So they're interested in that. So surplus in itself isn't bad, but what it does or what we do with it, that's kind of the, the key. And then the second piece, just to make sure that we have the, uh, the absorption thing clear, I think uh, it's really important to try to figure out like, why can't capitalists keep investing it into that, uh, the productive process. And like Matt said, you know, it's a problem of overproduction. Like if you're a shoe manufacturer and you have too many shoes, that creates all kinds of problems. It drives down the price of shoes. It uh, at a certain point probably reaches like a, you know, a point at which people don't want those shoes at all anymore. Or I often think of like food as kind of an easier commodity, right? Like um, people are like shoe collectors or whatever. But if you're like an onion farmer or something like <laughs> at a certain point, people aren't going to buy onions <laughs> and they're just going to rot. And in fact, that happens all the time in capitalist yeah. agrarian sectors, right? Like produce is left to rot in the field always um, because they don't want to flood the market and drive down commodity prices and all that kind of stuff. Um, and in fact, oftentimes uh, overstock is like outright destroyed, even in like fast fashion industries. They just like throw a bunch of clothes in the middle of the desert because they don't want to saturate their own markets. Right. So like you can't invest too much in the productive process because it will screw you over. And we know that they won't invest it in other kinds of things like healthcare or education. And we'll talk more about why that is, too. Part of it is just because they're greedy jerks or whatever, but there's good capitalist compulsive reasons not to do that, too. But I just thought those two things might be good, like, ground rules to get. Because I feel like if you don't have those two pieces, that surplus is itself kind of used in a specific way in capitalism and that overproduction and the absorption of that surplus is a specific problem in capitalism, then the rest of the conversation kind of like <laughs> will not make any sense at all. Yeah. No, totally. It's good that you, we took the step back because um, I think that there's like a tendency. I mean, you know, speaking of the story that we tell ourselves about capitalism and money and stuff, right? I think part of that story is that like the economy necessarily hinges on like the scarcity of resources mm -hmm. and um, – and, and, like, that there's a real drama between supply and demand. But I think what monopoly capitalism tells you is a different story, right? It's not about supply and demand. It's not about scarcity. But it's about the – it's about the – like, the abundance of production and about, like, how you play that off an already, like, oversaturated consumption sort of drive or a, 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 an already, like, saturated market in, in terms of, like, all kinds of cheap goods – I, I think that's actually a pretty important piece, right? Because it's not, I don't know, it, it's um, <laughs> it's like baked into the story that we tell ourselves that there's like some kind of lack, but yeah. there's not. It's there's too much, there's too much on both ends, too much production and already like too much stuff being consumed, and right. like that's why if you can't figure out the um, the the problem of absorption, like then you have a real problem on your hands, right? You can't you can't even add more stuff to the to the consumption because people are already consuming. Too much. Right. Too many onions already. Too many onions for sure. Um, so I think maybe this is at least a point where we can start pushing more into that waste conversation. So um, if they can't put surplus into production, uh, maybe the next two natural questions you might have are, first of all, why don't they just keep it? Why doesn't Scrooge McDuck just enjoy this big dirty pool that he has? Um, and of course, they do do that, right? Like they save and hoard lots of wealth that never gets reinvested or kind of used in anything among the capitalist class. 
and there's a wealth demand for money even. It's a big problem, and that is all true. But uh, you can't save it all because then you also can't make it all because the capitalist class itself, believe it or not, doesn't really have uh, enough sort of people desire and demand on its own to keep the economy going. And that's the sort of paradox of the capitalist class is like (laughs) capitalists would love to just have a, a sort of internal community that's only full of rich people, but they need working people to buy shit. <laughs> like the economy is complicated. Uh, it requires markets. It requires uh, wages even so that people have money to buy onions and everything else. Um, and so they can't just like sit on it all the time or else the economy will stagnate. It won't grow. And that means the capitalist uh, dragon horde also will not grow. Um, the pool will not get more than five feet deep. And uh, that's dangerous for diving. Um, yeah, that's actually the uh, the root of the argument, uh, like the capitalist argument for raising wages for for uh, workers, right? right? Is that if you have, if workers have more money to spend, they will for sure spend it because if you're, you know, poor or just don't have very much money, I guess, in the grand scheme of things, you're going to spend that money because you have to, right? You have to pay your bills. You have to mm-hmm. buy groceries. You're going to spend, you know, more money than um, a rich person would ever. Right. Uh, so it's, it's good for the economy, right? It stimulates uh, economic growth because people have money to buy to buy those onions that we all know and love. <laughs> exactly. And I mean, there have been capitalists who talk this way on purpose, you know, Fordism being the most famous that Henry Ford had this idea that anybody who works for the Ford auto company should be able to afford to buy a Ford car and that that would be good for Ford as well, because it would mean that workers wages were being put back into their own productive process. And, you know, it was a kind of collaboration between the the capitalist and the worker, right? This is this kind of like weird class harmony idea that you get in some capitalist economists too. And, uh, you know, Fordism is like <laughs> not a like humane form of capitalism at all, but it's one that at least understands that piece, right? Um, but like not all capitalists do and they don't have to. And so that creates these big stagnation problems. And of course, too, it's worth mentioning, like uh, Fordism didn't didn't save the U.S. from the Great Depression. Uh, the war did. <laughs> so that's very important. Um, OK, so capitalists on their own can't solve the problem by just like consuming with all their big hordes of money. So then the second question you might have is like, well, then what are you supposed to do with it? And that is, I think, the most interesting piece. So Brandon Sweezy lay out a few different areas where that surplus gets reabsorbed into uh, different kinds of places that are not production. So I thought I'd take a little summary here from uh, John Bellamy Foster, the notorious JBF, an editor at the Monthly Review. Um, he His dissertation was on Monopoly Capital, the book, and he published it himself um, as a book called The Theory of Monopoly Capitalism, which is also very complicated to read, (laughs) but uh, a pretty good book, um, I'm finding. And he summarizes this kind of different ways that uh, that waste can be used in, in this way. He says this. It can be used in the sales effort, which consists of waste in the business process. And that would be anything from like advertising to market research to uh, salaries and bonuses of salespeople, those kinds of things. Or also like lobbying, public relations, rent, maintenance of like showy office buildings, those kinds of things. So that's the first part of the sales effort, waste in the business process itself. And then B, waste in terms of the penetration of the production process by the sales effort, including variation in a product's appearance and packaging, planned obsolescence, and model changes. So one way that capitalists can waste that surplus is by dumping it into an effort to become stronger in the market uh, by advertising or kind of dumping it into, uh, you know, like those gaudy shows of like corporate dominance on the one hand, or by even kind of redirecting certain production to meet that sales effort, right? So like your iPhone, I don't know, is shitty every three years, you have to get a new one. That's one way of doing it. The second way is through military spending. Uh, which they note is a gigantic form of uh, just dumping loads and loads of surplus into something um, that also stimulates some sectors of the economy and keeps things going, even though there's no real use value for military spending other than like killing people and maintaining U.S. hegemony. I mean, there's a political use value, but like you don't need a gun. (laughs) And uh, 
the last one is diversion of potential surplus into the financial sector, meaning finance, insurance, and real estate. So dumping surplus into stuff that, again, is like imaginary in some cases, right? Insurance is like a bet against the future. Finance is like all kinds of non-productive products. And then uh, real estate, again, being uh, like <laughs> the commodification of your ability to have a roof over your head. Um, so there's and there's also one fourth thing that he doesn't mention here, but they mention in the book, which is uh, civilian government spending. So four big ways that waste happens, the sales effort, military spending, finance and uh, civilian government. Matt, I'm going to. I'm going to hand it over to you at this point. <laughs> I've been talking too long. <laughs> yeah, thanks. thanks. <laughs> but uh, that that's the big the big waste piece. Yeah, they break it down in different ways. I think that uh, JBF, he rolls in some of the civilian government stuff into the sales effort piece. But uh, there are reasons for doing that, I guess. But whatever. It's fine. So um, I think that we should talk about marketing and like the sales effort a little bit because I think that's actually a really interesting piece of all of this. And I mean, the other pieces are interesting too, but this is the one I think I'm most interested in for whatever reason. Um, last week, we talked a lot about the ways that uh, corporations have – I mean, what what makes monopoly capital monopoly capital is that corporations have monopoly power to set their prices high, um, which means that there's actually not much competition, right? Because there are a bunch of different corporations that are, you know, quote unquote competing in a particular sector. But if uh, they're all setting their prices high, then like, you know, whatever. Are they really competing in the end? No. You know, like a Big Mac and a Whopper are both priced similarly. And price competition has like more or less faded between the two. Yet some people are Big are Big Mac people and some people are big are Whopper people. Um, or, you know, Coke people versus Pepsi people. All kinds of really stupid distinctions that are made up. <laughs> illusory. Um, what Marx would call an illusory community. Are you a, uh, a person that uh, shops at McDonald's or one that goes to Burger King is uh, a dumb way to, to define <laughs> yourself. But, but yeah, we're doing it all the time. So the point here is that like the commodities that are produced are more or less the same. And the difference is fabricated through marketing. And because like, you know, you can't compete. You can't say like one has a, a markedly lower price or, you know, you know, maybe one does sometimes, but then one, the, the other does a different time. Uh, there's this whole thing that we talked about last week, really briefly called price leadership, where they'll kind of just sort of take turns at being the lowest priced whopper on the market or whatever. It doesn't matter. But, you know, since, since you can't rely on price being the distinction that sets you apart from other products and other commodities, you have to find other ways of doing it. And that is through branding and marketing. Um, this is from Mary Wren, this piece from Monthly Review again, which again, I, uh, I'll link in the show notes. But this is how she puts it. An increasing portion of surplus funds is thus funneled into marketing efforts, research and development of new marginally improved or slightly more specialized products, packaging and repackaging design and materials. And general promotion efforts such as advertising campaigns, public relations events, and consumer relationship management, to name a few, on the ever-lengthening list. So this is all important stuff because, like, you know, this is the stuff that people get so caught up in. Like, um, does the Starbucks cup – is it is it Christian enough to be the Christmas Starbucks cup or something, <laughs> right? Um, you know, uh, does, uh, does X brand have a loyalty program? How does it work? Do they have an app that you can log into that will post to Twitter whenever you buy coffee or whatever? You know, like all this kind of bullshit that is completely made up, um, completely, you know, illusory. Uh, but for some reason, we do actually believe it. Um, we'll talk about more about that in a minute, but I think that there's, okay. We've been talking about like a lot of like, uh, harder econ economics here, but I want to take a minute and talk <laughs> about a very soft idea, a very soft idea from a very, a very soft figure. Um, so yeah, just taking a step away from economics for one minute, Jean Baudrillard, he's like a, a French postmodern sociologist, I guess is one way you could say him, uh, one way you could describe him, he has a lot to say about media, and that's probably his claim to fame is talking about media. But um, he also has written a lot kind of in his earlier days about sociology and um, uh, consumer goods, I guess, is maybe how you could put it. So he has a book that's uh, pretty early on. It's called For a Critique of the Political Economy of the Sign, which is the world's longest and most unhelpful book title ever. <laughs> a Sufjan Stevens book cover. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely that. Um, but I think he says something that's really interesting. So in this book, what he's doing is like, um, well, basically it's this, right? In Marx, you get this thing called use value, like what it is an item is good for. Um, 
Some things have a really high use value, like uh, water has a really high use value. You can use it for everything. Um, but water also has a very low exchange value. Um, that's like, you know, uh, what what is, I mean, not exactly what does it cost, but like uh, how does uh, water kind of fit into the larger um, economic system um, of exchange? Um, so, yeah, like water, high, high use value, low exchange value. Um, or diamonds, low use value, high exchange value. Um, these are interesting ideas. Uh, Marx has a lot to say about these two things for sure. And lots of Marxists have come to say other things about them for sure. It's great. Look into it. But the thing that Baudrillard is saying is that there's a third, a secret third thing, a secret third <laughs> value that you need to know about. And that's the sign value. Um, so objects carry a particular sign um, that means something socially um, that when you see it, you automatically know something about that person and how they define themselves and how they think of themselves just because of what the sign or like what an object signifies. Right. So this is a quote from Baudrillard that I think is actually kind of helpful for parsing out like what's going on here when it comes to marketing and advertising and like commodities. Objects, their syntax and their rhetoric refer to a social objective and to a social logic. They speak to us of social pretension and resignation, of social mobility and inertia, of accumulation and acculturation, of stratification and social classification. Through objects, each individual in each group searches out his or her place in order, all the while trying to jostle this order according to a personal trajectory. So like I said, Marxists talk a lot about value, like use value and exchange value, but marketing gives us this other one. Um, I mean, the Baudrillard kind of like points out and it's sign value. So in monopoly capitalism, objects don't simply have a use and exchange value. They have to have something else because they have to have a way to differentiate themselves, if not just through like sheer price alone, right? They have sign value. So what's, you know, sign value is the question, like, what does the object mean within the array of other things in our society? And we all inherently kind of like understand this just from like living in the midst of it. I, I think um, it's it's pretty clear, right? Like there's a difference between um, the sign value of a Five Guys hamburger and a McDonald's hamburger. And it's completely stupid if you think about it hard. <laughs> like you, if you think about it too hard for like 45 seconds, you'll be like, oh, there's not really any distinction, right? Both are bad hamburgers, um, even though people will fight you to the death about that, I'm sure, right? Um, but but they have different they have different sign value. One means something that's different. One is like gentrified and one is not. <laughs> it has different connotations because of uh, the way that it falls within the, the larger sort of like societal feng shui of things. Um, and, you know, you can do it with all kinds of things, right? There's a difference between a shirt that you buy at Walmart and a shirt that you buy at The Gap. And and you know it, right? The Gap is like you're an upper middle class person who can afford nice clothes. And Walmart means that you're a poor person. I don't know. They're the same shirt. It doesn't matter. They're made, you know, they're both made in Bangladesh. They both could be the same color. It doesn't matter. But one has sort of like a different sign attached to it. One has different sort of cultural meaning. And uh, that's the important piece. Um, and, and, and like, I think what's what's um, striking about that is not just that, like, it exists and aren't we dumb people for all believing this mythology, but like, um, but but monopoly capitalism takes a, a big chunk of that Scrooge McDuck swimming pool and drops it into creating this exact illusion for us, right? It's not that we're like doing this because we're just dumb people <laughs> that, that believe in weird myths, but it's because capitalists have invested a lot of money in making us believe this thing. Um, they're great evangelists, if nothing else. Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, I think Brandon Sweezy even used that example uh, of evangelism in the book. Uh, yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah exactly, uh, which is very funny. But it's it's interesting because, um, you know, so the the whole point here is this is one way that the surplus gets wasted or kind of dumped into something that is not the production process. And one thing I found really interesting, they do this kind of very mini history of advertising in the book. And mm -hmm. they make this point that, like, in uh, the history of capitalism, like, there's always been some kind of, I don't know, like, ad copy out there. You know, you can, like go read very funny newspapers about like the miracle cure for baldness in the 1800s or whatever. But, uh, and you know, there's always been kind of snake oil salesmen or all that kind of stuff, but they make this point that it really isn't until the 1960s when they're writing this book that the ad sort of world or like advertising as an industry explodes, like just has this gigantic rocketing of investment from capital itself. 
Um, and they provided some data on it and all that kind of stuff. And the the reason that they sort of point to, it's like, you know, I think intuitively we could all say, yeah, there's a bit of a like self perpetuating pro- process here. Like we live in a mediatized society. And so there's lots of media stuff going on, lots of sign values being generated and so on. But they point to this material need to create that bizarre reality because in monopoly capital, they can't rely on price kidding. Uh, the only way that you can sort of have a, an advantage in the the market is through something like marketing, through advertising and so on. And it's a convenient place to dump all this uh, stuff that you're sitting on that can't go into wages, that can't go into production. So I just thought that was interesting too, that like, you know, when you read postmoderns, especially, they can give you all kinds of really good insights on like yeah. the world that you move through and how weird it is and why it feels that weird. And I love that. Um, that's like my first love in philosophy. So grateful for it. But the one thing that you don't get that I really appreciate in Brandon Sweezy is like, why is it that way? And it's not just because yeah. capitalists are weirdos, even though they are. It's like, because they actually need it to be that way or else there's going to be stagnation in the economy, <laughs> which is like a really yeah. weird thing to realize. I think, you know, what, what I really do appreciate too about Brandon Sweezy is the use of the word waste in this particular context. Because, I mean, I don't know. Well, we've been talking so much about Cuba lately on this podcast. And, you know, you can see exactly what Cuba does with surplus versus what, you know, a capitalist economy would do with surplus. You know, instead of, uh, you know, Cuba, there's there's doctors and there's teachers and that's what they got. They, that's what they that's what they're doing with their surplus. Right. They're reinvesting that into education and healthcare, And that is very cool. And, it, and like it makes sense. But in a capitalist economy, they've taken it. Like specifically from us, <laughs> I think, because I mean, that's workers are creating that that wealth in the first place, and like uh, in, instead of investing it in the people who are um, actually creating the surplus, they're blowing it on making an entire industry to lie to you about t-shirts. And like that's <laughs> what it comes down to. I don't know. It just makes me so mad. Yeah, um, it should because you can. It should, but you can see exactly what like you could do with that money, but. We're not because uh, our state won't expropriate the surplus from corporations or whatever uh, in a meaningful way. And yeah, uh, it's bad. They should do that. <laughs> it's bad. They should do it. Um, let's talk also about why they don't or why they can't do it, because that's also a really good uh, piece in the book. One of the ways that capitalism can waste surplus is through civilian government spending. And uh, they say that, you know, the government does do that it spends money on all kinds of stuff and it even spends money on things that are necessary to capitalism including everything from research and development to investing in innovation strategies to investing in uh protecting the u.s hegemony around the world so that it has a strong dollar and strong market through military force right like the government has a constitutive role to play in making sure that monopoly capital retains its power But what's really interesting is they say um, it's always a fight for investment into things like education and healthcare and other public goods, because every time that the government invests in a a public good, what it's also doing is creating competition for capitalism, right? Like uh, private education has to compete with public education. Private healthcare has to compete with public healthcare if if it has a, a kind of parallel system at all in that sort of reality. And what that really means is the state is kind of held back from spending that surplus on things that would be public goods, as opposed to a situation like Cuba, where that's a country that, in fact, doesn't have nearly as much total surplus or national surplus as the U.S. does and is actively prevented from generating it. And nevertheless, um, Cuba is a testament to how making more rational choices about where to put that surplus can uh, change the shape of your society such that you have so many doctors that you can send them away from your country in solidarity, right? It's like a different kind of excess. It's an excess of solidarity rather than an excess of uh, expropriated surplus value derived from working people, all that kind of thing. So I think yeah. it's it's just interesting to figure out like, yes, the government could actually dump that surplus into public goods And this is what, like, even progressive Democrats argue for, right? Like, uh, Bernie Sanders' whole kind of brand was to be out there saying, we've got to tax the billionaires, take some of that surplus back, dump it into public sector goods. And you can see moments of U.S. history where that sort of policy choice has 
made a difference in New Deal policies and all that kind of thing. But at the end of the day, Baran and Sweezy make this, I think, really insightful point that capitalism ideologically also does not want the government to create competing zones with capitalism. And so uh, what you really get is government investment into shitty stuff that protects the hegemony of monopoly capital. And that's about it. Yeah, I mean, um, there are so many great examples of that. This is just kind of off the cuff here. But um, the state that I live in, uh, Missouri, is hell on earth um, (laughs) for a lot of different reasons. But one specifically is because the um, you can see exactly how this plays out in terms of the private and public distinction uh, with education. So um, the state of Missouri keeps doing more and more to, I think, like, put the ball in the court of private education, of private schools, of uh, charter schools, and take uh, any power away they can from public. And I think that that, I mean, it's a great example, though, right, of exactly what you're saying, because um, the people that are in, you know, my state legislature are predominantly Republicans, and they are uh, a lot of business owners, which is very interesting, an interesting demographic. Um, But they're on the side of of monopoly capital and they have figured it out for as dumb as they are. So um, it's not like this is uh, this is not like black magic or anything. This is pretty common knowledge, I think, for people that are Mm -hmm. um, capitalists. (laughs) Right. Uh, There's also a really interesting sort of um, snake eating its own tail thing here, too. Right. Because uh, the dumping of profit into stuff that isn't public goods. Also, like if you're not raising wages, it makes workers have more and more precarious kinds of life. Um, And uh, the really the biggest way that you can cut cost in a monopoly capital situation and other forms of capitalism too, is by cutting labor costs, which is wages, right? That's the key. Uh, Wages are personnel and the working class generally suffer as a result of sort of trying to keep your costs low. And I think that is a really interesting point when you think about the lack of public investment And even drawing back public investment or kind of allowing private sort of services or (laughs) private industry or whatever to like replace those public goods, Um, it continually eats away at wages. And what that means is workers also don't have the buying power, don't have the demand uh, to be uh, the effective demand to sort of invest back into the economy. And so that also contributes to this big stagnation problem. So even as capitalists are trying to dump their surplus into places that are not like the productive process, um, socially, they're also like, you know, weakening a healthy economy, even in a capitalist economy, because like mm-hmm. they're so ideologically messed up that like they can't uh, throw the working class a bone, even though they need them, like they're always going to be bound to them. You know, yeah, saying that it's like a, it, you know, a snake eating its own tail, I think is the right way to put it. Um, that makes me think of, too, the ways that, like, um, monopoly capital is also, like, hmm, it is dependent on the welfare state in a really weird way. But it's also constantly, like, cutting, like, you know, those forces are constantly, like, lobbying against uh, <laughs> the welfare state, even. Like, uh, I think of, I don't know, every now and again, you'll see, like, those stories um, about how... You know, what percentage of, like, Walmart employees are on Medicaid or what percentage of McDonald's employees get food stamps or something? But, like, you know, these huge corporations that have – I mean, that are investing in in lobbying civilian governments to do particular things, to legislate in particular directions, right? They can get away with it because – their um, their workers are on food stamps. They're on Medicaid. Mm-hmm. They're getting, you know, they're caught up in the safety net. So like that's how McDonald's affords to pay workers so low because they're on food stamps um, or same thing for Walmart. Right. But at the same time, you know, they're all um, the same forces are also cutting against uh, those those like welfare policies in the first place. So it's like it is kind of burning, burning the candle at both ends. The snake is eating its tail. I can't. <laughs> again, I'm getting weighed <laughs> down in all these different uh, metaphors. But you, you can see what's going. You, you can see the contradictions I think present in in that like uh, in that wastefulness, right? And mm-hmm. and uh, when when big corporations can't throw workers even a small bone, you see how like <laughs> I don't know they they are put into more and more precarious situations. Um, and uh, I guess it'll probably just keep trending that way. Yeah. So we've talked about the sales effort. We talked about the civilian government waste. I think it's worth spending a little bit more time on the other two, uh, military spending and then diversion of surplus into finance. Um, 
And maybe it's good to start at the finance side because it fits in here too. So stagnation is a huge problem that capitalists don't want, even though they don't know that they're contributing to it. Um, and that stagnation, again, is that result of not having the kind of demand, uh, effective demand that you need to kind of keep everything going. Um, so one kind of interesting piece is that they're not uh, investing the surplus into production, so they put it into these kind of like more speculative or immaterial forms of production, non-productive production, you know, so finance, insurance, real estate, stocks, all that kind of stuff. And the irony is, whereas the corporation has this kind of almost like capitalist psychology of long-term goals, where it's trying to not necessarily like make or break in terms of profit, like pedal to the metal style, but it's just trying to make more today so that it can make more tomorrow in a sustainable way. Um, the stock market is the opposite, right? It's like you want to make as much as quickly as you can, and that's sort of the, the game. And what that creates is a uh, situation of inflation in those markets in the stock market. And so you get uh, what some left economists and others do, but left economists in particular call stagflation, this kind of cycle of stagnation and inflation or combination of stagnation and inflation, where on the one hand, you have an economy that's stagnating because demand is lower and the working class is not capable of kind of giving it some juice and so on and so forth. And at the same time, you get all this capital and surplus getting dumped into immaterial uh, forms of wealth generation who like where the, the way that you generate that wealth is by making a ton of money as quickly as possible. So inflation goes up because there's all this like uh, uh, attempt to raise the value as quickly as possible until you get to big crises like in 2008, right? The, uh, the subprime mortgage bubble, all these kinds of issues. And I think that's really interesting because uh, the way that surplus gets moved around, like no matter where it goes, it's basically going to screw over working people, right? <laughs> like you're going to get screwed over by having a stagnated economy. You're going to get screwed over by uh, inflation sort of eventually finding its way to you um, as it like makes its way out of, uh, you know, the problem in stock room boards or whatever, like. Uh, there's lots of really weird ways that working people kind of end up on the chopping block for all these really bizarre decisions that capitalists make that are ultimately totally irrational. Totally. I mean, I, I don't know. You can see it in the in the media cycle, though, constantly. And it's so frustratingly stupid, right? When people start talking about inflation and, um, uh, you know, well, I mean, I don't know. You'll, you'll hear about inflation every month because of job numbers, right? That's the first thing that comes up, and that's how um, people start judging the health of, a, of our economy is, like, how many jobs uh, were created this month and, like, what are wages at? And uh, people will constantly be drawing kind of connections between the the wages of a handful of, like, extremely low-wage people. Like, you know, oh, man, people are making – more people now are making 15 than they were previously or whatever. Um <laughs> but but you know they don't ever talk about corporate profits. They don't ever talk about how how much like these like giant corporations are actually making, um, and that's all opaque always, right? But it's uh it's definitely it's definitely because somebody somebody's making like sixteen dollars an hour. Um, yeah. That's why that's why prices are going up. Is what they want you to believe, right? Um, so the last piece here is military spending. Um, that's the other way that there's kind of waste that the surplus problem is answered through waste. And there's yeah. lots to say. A big about answer it. in there. Yes, huge answer. I mean, the military absorbs a ton of money. Um, everybody who listens to this podcast knows that. <laughs> Their chapter on the military also is really fascinating because, like, it also creates other productive opportunities, right? There's lots of jobs. I mean, some like state economies are so tied into the military that, like, if there was a massive drawdown in the military budget, it would like tank whole communities which is pretty right. messed up <laughs> like yeah it's fucked up how addicted the u.s is to the military such that like it kind of has to keep it moving um so there's that piece of it right it's a uh, it, it's absorbing surplus it's also creating more production capacity um more demand in different kind of sectors murder sectors specifically um lots of weird problems but also uh and i think this is I guess for me, the thing that I find most helpful, um, they spend a lot of time talking about like how ostensibly when they were writing this in the 60s, the argument for a strong military was uh, to oppose communist expansion, right? Explicitly, that was the, the argument. 
And they make a pretty <laughs> communist case <laughs> for, like, why they didn't think the Soviet Union was a military threat and all that kind of stuff, which is interesting. But the more interesting piece is uh, they say, OK, if it's not really about confronting the Soviet East or whatever, um, it must really be about something else. And what they conclude is it's about protecting uh, the U.S.'s position in the hierarchy of national economies, basically. Mm -hmm. And that's in the interest of monopoly capital, because guess where the monopoly capitalists, even if they're international, tend to be headquartered or based. It's in the U.S. or as contributors to the U.S. economy in one way or another. So the real key is they want to invest in the military because they're imperialists, right? They they know that you can super exploit the peripheries of the global economy if you have a military that can back you up and that can put down uh, resistance to that kind of project. And on one of the Cuba episodes, I read the passage they have about Cuba in this book where they basically say Cuba's ultimate crime is not a refusal to trade or participate in the world economy. In fact, Cuba was very loud about its willingness to do just that. Cuba's crime was the uh, suggestion that you could basically delink from the U.S. as like the country that calls the shots in your country at the end of the day. And that is a big problem. And that's why Cuba had to be disciplined so hard and why every other resistance movement around the world had to be disciplined. So the military absorbs a surplus for those kind of economic reasons that are maybe more boring, you know, the, the productive capacity and everything. But I think it's really important to make that a necessary piece, the imperialism piece that like uh, it also has to absorb the surplus there because it needs to protect the position of monopoly capital around the world. I think that is a, a super important contribution of the book. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's great. I mean, it does tie it all in together. Right. And it does explain, too, why. Um, a, a socialist movement can't just be about economics. It has to be about, you know, opposing, um, opposing war because it is caught up in economics, right? It's all, it's all tied together. I think it's a cool observation. Right. So there's a bunch of other stuff in the book that we didn't get a chance to talk about. There's a chapter on race that I didn't like very much, but isn't useless either. Um, a complicated 1960s <laughs> chapter about race and capitalism for sure. Um, there's also, uh, I think a pretty strong chapter that's almost like a more existentialist kind of thing about like the quality of capitalist society, which guess what is bad. Um, they're just like talking about how miserable it is to live under capitalism. Um, and that is really good. Not the kind of thing you get in a <laughs> economics book in my experience usually, but pretty interesting. So lots of other stuff going on there, but, uh, I don't know, Matt, let's see, we've done two episodes on monopoly capital. This is supposed to be a podcast about Christianity and the left. Um, why is this relevant at all <laughs> to those of us who go to church, who think about Jesus Christ, et cetera, et cetera? What's the point? What's the, what's the value for, what's the sign value of this book for Christians on the left? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think there's a few things that we could probably say about it. I, you know, I, this is what I think. Um, I think that there, Christians have like a particular, um, a particular calling towards, um, uh, a unique social ethic, right? One that privileges the poor, that stands in solidarity with people who are exploited. Um, you know, that kind of thing. We're always talking about it. It's great. We love it. <laughs> that's what Christianity, I, I mean, that's like, you know, Christianity at its best, that's the social ethic that's behind it, right? Is uh, the preferential option for the poor and trying to care for those people. Um, I think that is true. Um, but I think what this book kind of demonstrates to us is the way that the economy that we live in is structured um, so that those people cannot have a good life. I mean, that we can't have a good life either. It's true. It's all connected. But like, um, if you want to be a Christian, uh, this economy is not one that's going to make it very easy for you to be a Christian. Um, this is going to be an economy that definitely devalues the life of people who you're trying to stand alongside, the poor, people who are like, you know, um, uh, low wage workers and, and that kind of thing, but also people exploited in other countries for our own benefit. So I, I, I don't know. T to me, I guess like that's that's the, the like what this book is all about. Um, if Christians are supposed to like you know be on the side of a particular person, and I think that's true. Um, this book shows you the ways that uh, this economy cannot deal with that. Right? It's beyond the capacity of this particular con economy to be like um, e even 
to give to give you know working people and poor people a shred of dignity, and I think that's why this book is important. Mm-hmm. What do you think? What what else is there to say? I agree. Um, I think it's also helpful just to understand the moving parts of the economy that we live with too. Like, I agree in terms of um, trying to figure out uh, you know how to take up the preferential option for the poor. Um, when I think about it in re- like the trajectory of my own life, you know, we talked about on this podcast a bunch of times, like when I was younger, I was into Christian anarchism and like I wanted to drop out of the system as much as I could and, you know, not spend any money and learn how to make pants out of roadkill and all kinds of like <laughs> all that very weird stuff um, because I was like, I want to be an authentic Christian, right? I don't want to participate in a violent economy. But what's really important about a book like this is I think it shows like look, you can drop out all you want. At the end of the day, there's like a buttload of money floating around in this society. Mm -hmm. And like, it's going to get invested whether you like, I don't know, buy a Big Mac or not. (laughs) Like it's a, it's, it's a big problem. And it means that we have to organize against it in particular ways. It also means that like, I don't know, we have to think really carefully about what it really means to have an ethical posture toward capitalism. I mean, drop out as much as you can. Like, don't get me wrong. I don't know. It's a bad, bad situation. But also, like, self-flagellating over it is not going to help. Um, it's not going to change the economy. Uh, you know, not uh, not seeing the, the big Marvel movie is not going to change the economy, all that kind of stuff. So I yeah. think it's just helpful, too, to kind of get a sense of, like, what's really going on where is the the power actually being distributed and like how could we really build a movement capable of of creating a counter power to that like that's a hard question but it's important to maybe figure out where you fit into that which is like a pretty small but important piece Mm -hmm. that's good um great two great perspectives um it doesn't matter okay it, it might matter a little bit if you drop out. Like, it will matter for you existentially, internally. Yes. It'll make you feel a particular way. And I think that's good. Become ungovernable. That's great. Be a new <laughs> kind of person. Um, I think that's all good stuff. Um, but also, it makes it very hard to love your neighbors um, in every sense of that word. Um, capitalism is bad, I think, all across. Um, not only is it bad, but it's, like, frustratingly stupid. <laughs> I think <laughs> yeah, is the other yeah. part. Uh, it's it, it is a smack in the face of thinking people everywhere <laughs> that this is that, that you would spend, you know, um, you spend the money that could go towards uh, housing for people on a on a fighter jet or you would spend money uh, to educate people on tricking them about which hamburger is better. I don't know. It's mm-hmm. bad. I don't think that's good. And uh, the economy, it should be good and it should work for people. I don't know. Why not? <laughs> what if it was just good this is a thought experiment you should try sometime. Yep, I agree. So I guess maybe that's the key. Capitalism is bad, and monopoly capital is bad in these particular ways. <laughs> and that's all we go. Know about. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Magnificast. If you like what you heard, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash the Magnificast. Uh, if you support us there, you get uh, access to our cool Discord channel. You also get uh, access to a behind the paywall podcast called the Magnificast Lock In. We've been kind of light on them lately because of the holidays and, I mean, all kinds of other things. We have busy lives, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But uh, they're they're coming back in a big way, so subscribe and get these other cool podcasts, and it's great. More podcasts for you. Um, That's what you want, we think. Um, All right. Uh, Our intro music is by Mario Armstrong. Our outro music is by The Illogical Spoon, and we'll see you next week. Get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord. Jackson, keep your hoods up. Keep your hoods up and you stay up late in Jackson. You keep your hoods up, well you keep your hoods up and you stay up late. Oh, don't mind a cold night, but we might mind if you leave too soon. So come on now. 
it's still early. At least I would have.